Okay, so yeah, we're going to record this. Um, yeah, so my name is Scott Vlon. I'm the director of the Center for an Ecology-Based Economy here in Norway, and happy to have you all on board um, for this kind of, we're hoping, a momentous night where we start this new um, initiative for us, this bioregional regeneration initiative that Roberta's going to be talking about. Um, before we get going, I just would like to acknowledge that here in Norway and wherever you are, if you're in the state of Maine right now, that we are all on stolen land. And um, I'd just like to acknowledge that presence. And this project, I think, um, will be will be grounded in, in, um, in that uh, understanding that this land was bioregionally um, regenerating way before um, we got here. And if if we're lucky and if we're, we're really good at this project, we're gonna you know start to get back to uh, a place where humans and this and this land interacted together um, in a harmonious way. So just take a second to think about where you are and, and the history of that land. So, um, yeah, just a couple of things. Um, I guess most of you are aware of what CB does, so I won't get into that. We do have a couple of events coming up. I just want to share that are kind of related to this, especially one in particular on October 6th. We just we were about to have a seed saving workshop last week during when the um, tropical storm Lee came through. And I'm being told my audio and video is a bit choppy. Hmm. Are other people on Zoom seeing me okay? Because uh, it may be Mike's, um, okay. Anyway, yes, people are, it's working. Um, anyway, it's, um, so we're about to do a seed saving workshop with our local community garden and that got canceled or postponed. And we're gonna do that again on October 6th um, from four to 6 p.m. And there's gonna be a work party at the community garden before that in our community food forest. And I think um, in terms of regenerating our bioregion, um, one of our, um, notions is to is to kind of get back to this idea of an edible landscape and seed saving um, and the seeds aspect of seed saving of of um, evolving our food plants along with us I think is kind of important so love to see folks out for that and also on September 30th we are having our ninth annual electric vehicle expo trying to decarbonize our transportation system and that's at the high school here at the Oxford Hills High School on um, from 12 to 4 on the 30th. So I'd like to introduce Roberta. Um, Roberta is a local ecologist, and she's been on our board for a long time and is our new bioregional coordinator um, and is really pulling threads back from CB's or, original intention, which was to um, bring our area here in, in Norway, in the Norway area, the Oxford Hills area, the Western foothills, more back into harmony to build an ecology-based economy. Um, and we've we've been down many paths and we, we do a lot of different things. Um, and I think Roberta's vision is kind of, you know, again, taking us back to our roots and I'm really excited about this project. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Roberta. And then when Roberta's done, like I said, we're going to switch over to our Zoom owl, reconfigure a little bit, and then have a have a discussion. So Roberta Hill. Right. So um, thank you very much, Scott. And hello, everyone on Zoom. But I'm going to talk to the people who are in the room. So just forgive me. I'm not going to be looking at you, but I'm including you in my remarks. But I find it easier and more natural just to talk to the people who are in the room. So hello, people in the room. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to mark, can I do, can I do that a little bit? Sure. Okay. Um, I want to mark this occasion. It feels really special to me. In some ways, it feels like I have been um, preparing to do the work that I'm embarking on now, my whole life. Um, just to give a snippet of that, my life is too long to start this off with, but to give a snippet of that, when my kids were very young, um, it, it slowly settled in 
that the future that we were leaving them was not a future that I wanted them to have, that we would be leaving them uh, if we stayed on the current path. And I really, my maternal instincts just fired up and I was like, what, what am I gonna do about this? So it wasn't really the best time in the world for uh, um, economic and many other reasons, having two young kids and a job and all, but I decided I would go back to school and as I told my friends and family to learn how to save the earth and they would laugh and they would like, ha, ha, ha. But to be honest with you, if I think about what I have been doing and what I'm kind of stepping up my game on now, I'm the description of working in service to the earth is a pretty apt description of what I'm doing. So I feel like I'm fulfilling that promise that I made back then. So that feels really special to me. And I just want to thank all of you for being here this moment, this point in time. So, and all of you as well. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Oh, I have to thank um, CB because CB has um, become my community. It's the place where I can share my uh, fears and uh, grief and aspirations uh, with people who are uh, like-minded or kindred people and uh, who have put a lot of faith in me to, to launch this, this project. So um, thank you, CB. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. This presentation is going to run um, as little as 35 minutes and possibly as much as 45 minutes. So just be prepared for that. I do have a lot I wanted to say just to establish some really firm ground for us to have a really fruitful discussion um, afterward. And um, I, it's a discussion that I hope will continue for generations to come. So we're just kicking it off here. Um, so we're, oh yeah, can I, um, uh, can I just minimize it? Does that work? Is that all right? We good? So we're going to start here um, in our current predicament. I think it's really important. I know that many of you in this room and on this Zoom call are very and critically aware of where we are in this point in time as far as humanity and the, and the troubles that we face. But I just like the land acknowledgement that was just given, I feel it's really important to acknowledge the damage that we have done and are continuing to do to this beautiful planet with that gives forth so abundantly these exquisite life forms. Um, so I just wanna start by, by grounding in that. So we're gonna go into that, but only far enough as we have to, to make the point. And then we're gonna continue on and it will be more uplifting as we go along. But we'll start with the poly crisis. Um, so the, the, our climate um, system is breaking down in a number of ways. I think we're all you know, very, very aware of all of the um, things that are going on globally um, that are just, um, heart-wrenching and, um, you know, causing a lot of us to feel a lot of grief. But I want to talk specifically about the matter of tipping points. There was a recent study. Um, it, it was out of, um, it was led by a guy at the University of Exeter, but it was uh, affiliated with the Stockholm Resilience Center in Stockholm, Sweden, where a lot of really important climate work goes on. And they basically um, came up with 16 tipping points that we are heading toward um, that can be can be seen uh, by science. And the thing about tipping points is that they are self when these when we hit a tipping point, then the change that has been made becomes self perpetuating. It becomes and it has it can do irreversible damage. And passing one tipping point has the ability to set off other tipping points. So they're interconnected. And 
the same study showed that we're in the uncertainty zone for five of them. Are we already in uh, are we already in the process of that point tipping point being met? And um, just to focus on one of them. So that's there's 16. They all deserve a lot of attention, but we'll just focus on one just to, to make the point again. And this is the our ocean current system. And in particular, we'll look at the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or what's called AMOC. And it's basically the system that brings cold water down from the Arctic to the um, equator, and then brings warm water up from the equator to the Arctic. And it sets up this conveyor belt of water that circulates and it it's just enormously important for the health of the ocean and the fishery and the, all of that. But it also has extreme bearing on the climate system. So uh, this study has shown that it's likely that AMOC will slow down and stop, halt somewhere between 2025 and 2095. So do the math, that's less than two years is a possibility. When it shuts down, it will have abrupt consequences. So sea level rise because of the, um, of the ice sheet melting and all of that, that's what's starting to the interference in the first place. That's going to cause its own amount of sea level rise for us here in Maine. But then if the current shuts down and along with it, the Labrador current, um, there's going to be a very abrupt um, sea level rise associated with that as well. The Northern Hemisphere will become much colder and there'll be changes in rainfall, especially in the Amazon, or the basically the equatorial uh, rainforests, which are the lungs of our planet and, um, and so on. So it's very bad and um, just for an example of what that could look like is if AMOC slows down, stops, and creating this climate chaos, which is likely to ensue floods, droughts, and even more floods, droughts, and fires. And even two of the Earth's major breadbasket areas are affected by that. It could lead to um, the death of one billion people on the planet in a single year. This is, we have eight, eight billion people or not quite eight billion yet, one in every seven or eight people. And um, th it is a, for me even hard to imagine that scenario uh, and what it would look like playing out. But again, that that's where we are. And, um, and the fact that climate is not the only problem that we're facing right now, that's why it's called a poly crisis. Um, these same scientists have also been tracking these, um, basically these planetary boundaries, these um, boundaries, these earth systems that are seen as critical to life on planet earth. There are nine of them that they've identified and that they've started studying. They haven't fully studied the ramifications for each one, but so far six of the nine planetary boundaries have been, are, are in overshoot. So um, climate change you can see there is one of them, but then there's novel entities, that's microplastics and those kinds of things, which is now not only in the whole food web globally, but it's in the uh, microplastics are in the atmosphere and they have all kinds of implications for life on the planet with regard to interfering with critters, endocrine systems and so on, which is basically the system that allows us to procreate. And, um, but biosphere integrity is another one. So uh, this is our biological um, diversity on the planet and the fact that we're losing, it's estimated about 600 um, species each year and um, that we're in what's called the sixth mass extinction. So that's bad. And then we have to just be mindful of this one, which isn't talked about much in terms of humans, but we all understand this idea of carrying capacity as, as living beings, we, we are amongst all living beings and that if there are resources, we exploit them to the fullest 
And when we can't exploit them, our numbers grow. And when we run out of resources or have destroyed our resources in some way, our numbers plummet and there's a crash in, in the population. This is, was just recently posted in the New York Times showing our population growth at humans on the planet. And it doesn't even go back to the beginning of humans. Like humanoids have been here for 300,000 years, modern humans, 600,000 years. And our population has been steady, 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 thousands and thousands, tens and thousands of years. And then um, uh, it, basically the Holocene, this period of this beautiful period uh, on planet Earth, when the climate became very, very stable, allowing for agriculture and civilizations to flourish. And with that, the more resources and uh, then the population could start to grow. And then by the time a fossil fuel energy came along that allowed us to exploit more and more resources, that fossil fuel energy um, really caused our population to skyrocket. And we're now at 7.7 .7 billion people and rising. And as a result of that, and as a result that many people on the planet do eat meat, humans now comprise 98% of the animal biomass on the planet, wildlife coming in at 2%. So what has happened is that we have become a geologic force. This started happening, they figure sometime back in the 70s that we basically, or excuse me, the 50s with the um, setup of the atomic bomb, that's probably when it started. But the, the humans are a geologic force capable of transforming planetary systems. And there's a, a new name for this geological um, point in time, it's, and it's been called the Anthropocene, basically the human driven um, time of, of geologic history. And um, the thing is, that we have to get out of the Anthropocene as quickly as humanly possible. It's not a good place to be. It sets us on an extremely bad trajectory. And um, the I love this word. This was coined by this um, environmental philosopher whose work I, I'm very fond of, Glenn Albrecht. And he basically coined the word symbiocene, which is, I think, a very good way to um, to bring in uh, the quality of this new epic that we could bring into being if we work together. He basically describes it as a new era that nurtures all aspects of being human in a world of other beings. And so, um, and I also just want to point to this beautiful piece of textile art done by Claire Otwell. She's out in um, the Cascadian bioregion, our corollary on the West Coast. And um, she's a, a magnificent artist and I've met her through the design school, which I'll be talking about later. Um, and so I just wanted to give a shout out to Claire. Um, and this uh, piece of art is also on the cover of the book that we're reading in the book club, which is Joe Brewer's uh, book, which we'll also talk about in a moment. Um, so can we do that? Can we? escape the Anthropocene and move toward the Symbiocene. And I love this um, way of putting it by Kevin Brown. He's a member of the British Labor Party, but he basically said, okay, well, it might not be possible, but we now must do the impossible because the, the probable has become the unthinkable. So that's where we are. And so being that that's where we are, that we have to do the impossible, um, how do we do it? And I look, I look back at the work of Donella Meadows. She basically and her team at MIT, they were commissioned by the Club of Rome to basically um, develop models and computer models in an age when computers were still pretty primitive compared to what they are now, but models of are there limits to the growth of humans on the planet? Will there be a time when we bump up against bio geo physical um, boundaries that don't allow any more growth and cause our population to crash. And actually the scenario that they came up with for business as usual, they came up with various scenarios, like we solve all of our problems 
we still have none of our problems, but business as usual, we have tracked almost identically to that line. So she really knew what she was talking about. And she basically also came up with a schema for describing points at which we could intervene into the system and change it, fundamentally change it. And each of these is worthy of discussion, but just to get to the bottom line here, those that are the most effective, where you have the most leverage is changing our mind frame, changing our worldview and adopting a brand new paradigm. So that's what we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, it you know it's not difficult to do if you've ever had an epiphany that says that's wrong this is right you know that in an individual that can change it's not so easy to do at this massive global culture view and um so i want to look at paradigms and um I've used this kind of scary monster picture. I just wanna give a little disclaimer here. I don't think everything that's come out of this mechanistic worldview has been bad. In fact, there's been a lot of amazing new understandings of the beauty and the intricacies of life on the planet, music, art, all the rest. But, but there has been um, what we have done by adopting this worldview is we have forgotten that this way of looking at the life at, at life on the planet is a tool, you know, if we atomize things, take them apart, if we dissect things, we do learn about them, but it is a tool. It's not the way life is. Life is not atomistic. It's not mechanistic. It's not individualistic. So we have forgotten that we, um, what we've, that we knew as a, a human presence on the planet for tens of thousands of years, and that is that we are connected to the planet. So we're very fortunate, despite all odds, that there have been people on the planet who have carried this original worldview of being interconnected on the planet and having a responsibility to the planet um, and uh, reciprocity and all the rest, um, carried that forward. And uh, we owe our uh, the indigenous people that uh, remain on this planet an enormous debt of gratitude for carrying that knowledge forward. And um, so what we're looking at then is a life affirming worldview where the cultural story is based on interconnection and a respect for all life. And um, humans not separate from nature, humans not at the dominant you know, pinnacle of the um, pyramid, but humans as part of nature, it, uh, very much dependent on the rest of nature for our well-being and for theirs. And I I like this because we have to, we're in this in-between place now. And I love this illustration. This was uh, created sometime in the mid 1800s. It became popularized then. And if you Google duck rabbit, you'll get all kinds of iterations of this that are really beautiful. But the idea here is that you can look at that illustration and see a rabbit, or you can look at that illustration and see a duck but you can't see them both fully at once. So, so you have to have a mind shift in order to go back and forth between duck and rabbit. And we're kind of there right now. We live in this world of with this dominated by this mechanistic uh, point of view, and yet we're moving toward this new and old uh, worldview of, of um, world being in, of all life being interconnected and you can get pretty good at shifting back and forth really quickly but um i, I just think it's a it's a good a illustration of where we are i think as an ecologist that one of the best ways to start um getting peace people used to this new paradigm if it is a new paradigm to them i was raised in the old paradigm I was sat down in front of a TV when I was a kid and had all the advertisements telling me all the stuff I needed and all the rest. But if we want to teach our young people, if we want to help others to understand uh, the importance of this worldview, we need to teach them how the world really works and, um, and, and get everybody starting to think 
ecologically. And I think if we thought ecologically um, and had an, as a result, had an ecology based in economy um, and uh, ecology based education and all the rest, if we could do that, um, we would be well on our way to making this paradigm um, the dominant one. And so thinking ecologically provides a, a better understanding of the complexities and interrelatedness of the polycrisis. It provides us with a rationale for activating and organizing around um, localities, and in particular at a bioregional scale, and also is just a really key part of that knowledge system that will help us to um, understand and to identify and to achieve our goals. So thinking ecologically, number one is that life is anti-entropic. Entropy is second law of uh, thermodynamics basically says that um, all matter goes from less organized states to uh, or more organized states to less organized states over time. The whole universe is obeying that law of entropy, except where there's life. And the only place we know where there's life right now is on planet Earth. And life is anti-entropic. It's syntropic, which is quite astounding when you think of that. And so because we've had the same matter on the planet for 4.8 billion years or however old the, the planet is, it just keeps getting recycled and recycled and recycled. And while it recycles, it starts forming this very complex web of relationships and miraculously creating more complexity from less complexity. We don't stop to think what a miracle that is. If you take a biology course, they never talk about that. It's, a, it's the study of life and they don't talk about that. Why? Why is life anti-entropic? So we've gone from gr green slime on the oceans into all of these, again, just exquisite life forms. Another way to think into lot uh, ecologically is to think in interconnected ways. And I just love this quote, and I'm just gonna leave this be this um, marker for this, for this quality. Pull a thread here and you'll find it's attached to the rest of the world. That is the way the world is. And um, because again, of these, these, this web of interconnections. It also, the way the world works, and when you start thinking of ecologically, you're very keenly aware of the fact that everything in nature is continually changing. So there's all of these words that we use to describe these changes, growth, seasonality, mutation, succession, transformation, metamorphosis, evolution. This is all about change. And the good news there is that, so if we're thinking ecologically, we understand that if a system or something is no longer working, it's ripe for transformation. And we are ripe for transformation now. Reciprocity is another way to think ecologically. In nature, this practice of exchanging things between life forms, between organisms, sometimes called mutualism, symbiosis. This uh, example of the lichen here is really good, especially to me as a plant ecologist, um, that if it, if it hadn't been for the algae deciding <laughs> to integrate with the, um, the fungi, we would not have lichens, which are really one of the earliest forms of plants that was able to, not plants, but life forms to come up on earth and was the origin of all the plants on the planet that gave rise to all the rest. So this coming together, it's the, it's the it was exception, excuse me, it, it is the rule, not the exception. And so then as I start thinking ecologically, it starts, it's helping me to frame the questions that we need to be asking. And these are just some of them, but, and I think we could think of a whole bunch more, but to think ecologically means to think, what can we be when we come together? What can we imagine together? What can we co-create together? How can we, how best can we create space for learning, playful experimentation, contemplation, celebration, healing? That, those are deeply ecological questions. And so 
that will get us well on our way to thinking ecologically. Complexity is another way we do this, understanding complexity, uh, being mindful of it, trying to understand as much as we can. There's complexity science where we're trying to sort it all out. But the bottom line is, and I think it's put really well by this guy, Frank Edwin Egler, who actually was one of the collaborators with Rachel Carson on the book Silent Spring. He said, nature is not only more complicated than you can think, it than you think, it's more complicated than you can think. So that brings with it a sense of humility. Okay. We don't have have the ever, we will not ever have the full picture. And because we don't have the full picture, we will act in a way that's more appropriate. Um, another way of thinking ecologically is in fractal, fractals and nested scales. Life is built on these parts within parts, within parts, within parts, within parts, within parts, within parts uh, unfolding in these just amazing ways. This, so the way to do this is to start thinking of everything as both a part and a whole. So a cell is a part of a human body, but a human is also a part of a community. A human is part of a bioregion. A human is part of the population of life on earth. A human is part of an ecosystem. So again, parts and wholes, everything as a part, everything as a whole. And because the cell is itself a self-contained little unit, it has a membrane around it. It basically has just an amazing, array of things going on in a single cell without any consciousness on the part of, our brains are not doing that, okay? That cell has a consciousness of its own, a intelligence of its own, able to get rid of waste and bring in new resources and um, you know charge up its batteries and whatever else it needs to do, maintain its membrane, um, ward off diseases, it does all of that as a self-contained little unit embedded in, again, the tissues and the rest of the body. But um, so that decentralized intelligence is another way of thinking ecologically to understand that there's an intelligence that is infused through all of life and perhaps um, some say the entire universe. Um, the membrane of a cell is really important of concept to kind of bring into this idea of bioregionalism too, because we're talking about putting a boundary on a map. Where it's our bioregion, it's gonna have a boundary, but membranes teach us that um, borders should be porous, malleable, regenerative. They should delineate the unique identity of an area, but also allow interaction, communication, coordination, exchange with the surroundings. And so um, I'd like to think of our bioregional boundaries as cell membranes. Um, and the, the same, the same patterns go up and down the scales. So it's pretty clear from the science and from all the people who are just putting an awful lot into thinking about this, that saving life on earth in the most just and expedient way will involve fully assuming our evolutionary role as caretakers of all life um, at scales of planetary significance. And what is a scale of planetary significance? You know, we can do we can do this work as an individual. We can do this work um, in our communities, like CV is doing here. It's tremendously important. But if we're the only community doing this, it, it's, it's not a sustainable or a, a regenerative, uh, ultimately regenerative for the entire earth. And we're talking earth planetary systems are the ones that need healing right now. So we, we've got to do the healing at the planetary scale. And basically it's, it's been put forth that the bioregion is that scale, that appropriate scale. Um, is in simple terms, bioregions are small enough to feel like home but they also provide for a sustainable, regenerative life for all inhabitants within the, the bioregion. So they have to be somewhat self-contained, though again, porous, porous membranes, some interaction with outside bioregions. But if we can organize at that bioregional scale um, in a very decentralized way, let's remember the idea that these units, these towns, these um, uh, 
cooperatives, these um, groups, each one of them may have its own identity. And so there's gonna be a very built in to this work, the idea of decentralization. One Earth, which is a bunch of researchers that are working on this, have come up with eight, 185 discrete bioregions. Again, borders are malleable. They're going to change over time, especially with climate uh, really shifting on the planet. But how are they defining the, a bioregion? How bioregions are typically defined is by these physical features like topography, landforms, watersheds, geology, soils, climate, seasonal features, but also biological features, plants, animals, whole ecosystems. And importantly, uh, they're defined by human culture and life ways. And so because we are part of nature, if we don't include humans into this equation, we're completely missing the point. And um, the, the idea, I just wanna say a little bit about bioregionalism itself. I'm not an expert on bioregionalism. I've come kind of late to understand this. I'm a newcomer, but there are people who have been working on this, uh, these concepts for a long time. Um, it was basically some people came together, Peter Berg among them in the 70s uh, for a U the UN conference on human environment. Again, Stockholm, Sweden, Sweden. It's like this hot spot for amazing thinking on the planet. Um, anyway, uh, they the people came together to discuss this idea. The people who wanted, in, in Peter Berg's words, to do more than just save what's left. They wanted to basically to figure out how e damaged ecosystems could be regenerated. And so um, one of the things that, uh, uh, statements that Peter Bergman, I'm going to share a few statements right now of people who are more well-versed in this concept than I am. So Peter Berg and one of his colleagues first said that a bioregion refers to geographical terrain and a terrain of consciousness to a place and the ideas that have developed about how to live in that place. So that work has gone on. Okay, neoliberalism, ne neoliberal hammer came down on a lot of what came around in the 60s and 70s and it kind of squashed a lot of, and it continues to uh, work on squashing a lot of um, the good visionary work that was being done in that time to bring equity to um, people and place on the planet. But basically that work has continued up to this day and more modern thinkers. Um, Daniel Christian Wall is uh, basically wrote the Bible on designing regenerative cultures. He's, he describes the bioregion in this phrase, we can only avoid biospheric collapse if we come home to place and region again, re-inhabiting every bioregion as we transform our impact from one of exploitation and degeneration toward becoming healing and regenerative custodians and nurturers of the ecosystem we not only inhabit, but can become living expressions of. And I truly love that because we are all beings of the earth, that we at, at kind of this, in some ways, amazingly endowed life form are able to not only appreciate uh, life on the planet, study life, understand life on the planet, but to speak for life on the planet. We are the planet's way of speaking on behalf of life. And I just love that, that idea. Um, and then this is another quote from base, uh, a fellow that I've actually met through the design school uh, out in Cascadia. They are kind of way ahead of us in the development of bioregion. They actually have a Cascadia department of bioregion and they've got just a really uh, rich amount of work that's already been done in mapping regenerative practices across the bioregion and stuff. But Brandon Letzinger, who's with the Cascadia Department of Bioregion said this, I think it's a really nice way to sum it up. Culture is a sum of our personal and interpersonal relationships and choices, many of which are defined shared values and needs which arise from sharing a place. A bioregion is the most efficient and largest physical scale on which these cultural connections that arise from place will make sense. 
So again, small enough to feel like home, large enough to have this ecological cohesion. Um, and so what's our bioregion? And um, there's a lot of not only ideas of what the bioregion looks like, but there's a, lots of ways of naming our bioregion that are out there. No one settled uh, way. So I think that's part of the work is going to be coming up with the way that we want to put our bioregion forth to the world and start thinking about it coherently. And um, the Acadian Northern Forest is one of the ways it has been named or simply the Acadian bioregion. And um, the boundaries, again, there's no clear, clear boundaries of what it looks like, but these are two um, interpretations, one done by the US Geological Survey and one done by a group of researchers, academics, um, uh, working in collaboration with uh, the Wabanaki Federation. Um, they're called Two Countries, One Forest, and they've come up with um, this map. I liked their map a lot, and they're also, I've made contact, just preliminary contact, I would say. They seem like very approachable. I think they'll be an enormously uh, important resource and collaborator on this work. But um, they're basically right on their website where they've put forth this map, recognizing that as any shifting is done to these boundaries, they'll be done in um, very much in um, consultation with their indigenous um, colleagues. And this is because the, the this area has deep historic roots. And as as um, Scott said at the beginning, the Wabanaki people have been managing the spio region for since time immemorial. And they basically, this is a map um, that's on the Wabanaki um, Federation website. It's basically their description of um, their traditional homeland, their traditional region. So it tracks and maps pretty closely to this interpretation built on geologic, biologic, ecological features and human culture. Within bioregions, there are subregions and how you parse that out is also up for grabs, really. There, you could break the area of Maine down by watersheds or the whole bioregion, you could break down by watershed. This show just shows our major watersheds in Maine. Um, the Maine Natural Areas Program has their interpretation of what they call ecoregions, these subregions. Um, Western Maine Foothills is a subregion delineated in this map that was done by the US EPA. And um, the, the North Nature Conservancy also has their interpretation of these subregions. So again, we've got a lot of kind of sorting out and consultation to do. But we're not alone in doing this work and starting down this path. There are people all over the world who are thinking and acting at the bioregional scale, collaborating at the bioregional scale. And I've met some of these folks through my um, involvement in the Design School for Regenerating Earth, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But of those bioregions that have already really taken this work on and are really running with it, um, Cascadia and the Colorado River Basin, Northern Andes and the Great Lakes Basin. And we have a lot to learn from what they have already done. So we have just this enormous resource in the work that's already going out there. I wanna just talk just briefly about the design school because this is where, uh, this is my home for doing this kind of thinking and learning. And I have met some amazing people, including these, well, three people plus Elise, um, who are the co-founders of the Design School for Regenerating Earth and um, just are um, each amazing people in their own right. Joe Brewer, who is the author of the book that we are currently reading as a book club, The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth, um, and Penny Heipel and Benji Ross. And through that school uh, founded by these folks, um, I again have met just some amazing people and have learned what they're doing and how they're doing it. And um, so 
you know, from the Cascadia, the, the Cascadia, the, um, Joe and Penny are leaving, like, I think within a week's time, maybe Penny, you're on the call, you can tell us, but basically they'll be going a 30 day tour of the whole Cascadian bioregion, which is huge. And they'll be going to 14 different uh, cities and, and working with a hundred different um, collaborators on this tour to activate people in the Cascadian bioregion to just really um, bring more energy to what they have already been doing, as I said, for, for years. Um, there's work being done also in the, um, the Great Lakes area, especially in the greater Toronto area where they have this uh, uh, project they call the Legacy Project. And they're not only mapping the Great Lakes and the regenerative um, uh, practices there, but also doing a lot of really important intergenerational work, uh, bringing elders together with young people in a way that has been done, again, since time immemorial, that was the, the norm, not the exception, that our elders were the ones teaching our children, where the, while the adult level folk were out uh, working and trying to make, make ends meet. So um, this is a, a, a very natural thing to come together around bioregions, is this intergenerational work. I'm really excited as an educator to bring that into this. Um, and, and, and more, so the, the um, Colorado River Basin, they had a, a similar tour where uh, all three, uh, Joe, we call them PB and J, Penny, Benji, and Joe, uh, went, uh, did a tour all from the headwaters of the Colorado River all the way to the Sea of Cortez, where the Colorado River should empty into the Sea of Cortez, but no longer does so. Um, because it's been so abused. And following that, just like last week, they had a landscape leader retreat of bringing together people from across the landscape to start talking about next steps. And um, that was a five-day retreat. And in Joe and Penny's home territory of Barichara, um, Colombia, they're integrating with other um, bioregions in Colombia in the Northern Andes. And um, they're again, doing incredible regenerative work, but also setting up um, uh, models and uh, ways of thinking about regenerative funding models. And they're prototyping regenerative um, uh, governance systems. So that, again, is just something that's already going on out there that we can learn from. And so I just want to kind of start concluding here by saying we've got some exciting uh, things coming up involved with the design school that CB will be collaborating with his design school and Joe and Penny, at least maybe Benji will be coming here in January to start having a conversation about how we're going to uh, move forward here in the Acadian bioregion and moving toward a bioregional tour here in our home bioregion to take place in the fall of 2024. And any of you and any of you who would like to be um, part of those early conversations in, in January, please reach out to me and let me know. And we'll make sure that you are involved. Um, I wanna say that on the Design School Mighty Networks platform, I've already created a space as a design school level member. I'm able to create space there. They have two levels. You can also join as a community member which is five bucks a month. And honestly, if you're interested in this work, I can't think of a better way to spend five bucks a month because it's just such a rich place with so much learning going on, which I forgot to mention. It's right in the middle of the slide there. Um, Joe and others in the school are continually giving amazing uh, courses. And that's part of the part of the deal when you when you join at a community level is to have access to those courses. But um so we have a spot there. It's not very robust yet because I'm waiting for some people to join. So hint, hint. And, um, and so where, you know, where are we going with this? These are just some of the ideas swirling in our minds. But again, this discussion is to start kicking off. Uh, how do we prioritize these, these thoughts? But we need to just start really building this uh, network and weaving our story of place, a story of our bioregion. It's really important to start mapping these regenerative practice and these practitioners across our bioregion to help collaboration and sharing of all the good stuff 
amazing stuff that's already going here on here, which uh, is being represented here in the room tonight that uh, can be part of this. Um, we are, you know, can we do collaborative restoration and regeneration projects together? Can we help each other out with projects, even just by getting the word out uh, to our constituents about what's going on in, an, in another part of the bioregion? Community building, community art, so much potential for bioregional community art as a way of conveying this and helping to shift the worldview. I don't think anything can do it perhaps better than art. And, um, and integration with the other bioregions, which is ultimately where we're heading. Once the bioregions have been, are starting to develop, it's this cross-pollination between and connection between bioregions that is the goal. And with that, I will leave you with this photo. I wanted to have a photo at the end of a mycelial network. Mycelium being the way that fungi are connected under in the earth. And so I Googled mycelial bridge and this picture came up and it's a mycelial bridge basically built of blocks that have been fabricated from mycelium. And there's some uh, a Stanford um, researcher who has created a business where he grows mycelium blocks that are stronger than cement, completely biodegradable, um, and they're uh, and they're useful for all kinds of stuff. So, I think that's kind of a hopeful note to leave on. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oops, wait, it didn't stop. There we are. Hello. Now we're going to hook the owl up, everyone. And I can get rid of that close. And I can make that big. What do I need? Otherwise, it's not going to be here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, everyone, if you look, we're going to take like a how long? We've got five? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Here, we've got some refreshments here. I'm going to grab some refreshments on here. And and when you come back, if you don't mind, um, turn the camera on so that we have a discussion. Because you, you should be able to see us, and we should be able to see you with all the technology that it works well. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> okay. Saturday or Sunday. Who wants to appear tomorrow? Oh. And that's the 